do you want me to, to go? I, is there like a... Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, well, um, uh, I'm really honored uh, that y'all would have, uh, you've invited me to be here. Um, uh, when Alex uh, approached me about uh, talking about vocation, I, I questioned uh, if I had anything really to say. Um, I'm going to, I guess, just briefly tell my story because it was kind of boring enough to live. I can't imagine you want to hear too much of it expounded upon, um, but it is definitely going to be uh, touching on uh, some awkwardness. Uh, you're going to see a lot of my own neuroses come out uh, because while I don't like talking about myself, I do have a somewhat uh, sick desire to be seen and known. And so that's gonna uh, end up uh, playing out with probably a lot of self-deprecation and uh, poorly timed and executed humor. Uh, so there you go. Um, my wife is also down there in a little box, which is nice. Uh, I haven't had a chance to really say hello to you yet today. Um, yeah. uh, so yes, uh, my name is John and I do some of the choral music at uh, UNI. Um, I was really fortunate and I grew up with a loving family and um, my father is a Baptist pastor and my mother as I was growing up was a piano teacher and uh, their fingerprints are all over kind of my my pathway through life. Uh, I started playing piano at a really young age, it's about three and by the time I was 12 I left um, the the church where my dad was and started playing piano for a Hispanic mission. Uh, we, I grew up in Arizona. And so, you know, my early experiences with faith are, um, and vocation are, are really uh, guided by the fact that I left the church at a pretty early age and, um, and would just raid my dad's library and read philosophy instead of paying attention to the Spanish that I didn't understand. Um, I went to a Christian college and uh, really was a goober uh, throughout my time and was not a, an extremely successful student, uh, was a more successful uh, musician uh, than I was a student. That's where I met my wife and um, really early on learned that as a music major, I didn't wanna be in performance and uh, really just kind of was listless for the most part. Listless might be the wrong term. I just didn't care about having a pathway. Um, I just kept walking and didn't really have a plan, I think might be the best way to, to say it. Um, I kind of fell backwards into graduate school and uh, attended a seminary there at Baylor and then fell backwards again into a music program there and for a time at that point I started thinking I might get involved in church music and um, uh, as soon as I was offered a job uh, I turned it down because that's apparently what you do and fell backwards into more graduate school at uh, the University of Texas and at that time I thought well maybe I'll teach church music and when I finished I was offered a job and I turned it down and prompting my father-in-law actually to call my father and say, when is your son ever going to get a job? Um, and then I kind of settled in on my, um, on my career path where I am now. And just a few years later ended up at UNI. And so I think that for me, my pathway through vocation, um, was really learning to separate vocation from profession. And uh, I think that there was a, a long period in my 20s or all of my 20s uh, when I uh, really felt like, you know, I, I, at that time in my life, I would have used the word call. Um, I, don't, I don't think I would use that language anymore, um, but I, I really felt like to be called um, and to, to serve, that it was um, 
primarily in a clergy role and that's what I was feeling. And I think that a lot of that was untangling my own um, feelings of wanting to be just like my dad and um, accepting that, that I can make a, a difference um, not being a clergy um, and then decided to marry one in, in, instead. Um, and so that is, I think in a, a broad view, I think kind of my, my pathway, uh, as I've been thinking about vocation and what it, um, what it has meant to me, I would say that it is, I would say for me, it has been more of a becoming of myself and um, more of a, an acceptance of, of, of myself and all of my faults and um, all of that. So that's enough talking for now, I feel like. So I'm going to stop the talking. Is that fair? Is that what you were looking for, Alex? <laughs> Let me ask some, are you open to asking questions? Yes, of course. Say, say more about falling backwards into things. <laughs> with right. A, with some more stories, because that, that, that resonated with me. I think I have fallen backwards into some things. And so can you explore that a little bit? Yeah, I think that it's frankly a sign of my, my privilege um, that I've been able to, to do that. And um, also a, a sign of my, um, of my relationship with Amy that she has allowed me to continue to fall. Um, the so specifically, uh, I would say that when I was graduating college, for instance, I um, had no no clue what I was going to do. I was a vocal performance major and had a very specific set of skills, uh, and then no other skills. Uh, the same is still true, by the way. And I, as I said, I, I was a poor student. Uh, I flunked chapel six times, I think, is that right, Amy? Yeah, you're on mute, honey. <laughs> I was gonna say it felt like that at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 was, I was a poor student. I just, I didn't take things very seriously. Um, and so I, I, I was really in trouble. And as it happened that year, um, I ended up conducting, uh, a, a choir out of the Baptist student house. Um, and there was about 40 kids in the choir. And it was really the first time that I kind of felt that I had that opportunity. And um, it had gone well. And um, I think that there was an advocate for me who just uh, uh, unbeknownst to me, um, submitted my name for a scholarship to go to seminary. And I, and you know, the April of the year that I was graduating, I just got a letter in the mail saying that I had a, a substantial scholarship to, to go to seminary. And so I said, well, I guess I'll do that. And um, so that was one of those moments of falling backwards. You know, the same thing happened. I spent a year away from music because I was sick of it. And um, I suddenly found myself that first year seminary practicing piano three, two or three hours a day um, when I was away from the academic side of it. And I was thinking, well, maybe I should go and do some music. And then suddenly I got a call from the School of Music offering me an assistantship. And I hadn't even applied for anything. And it was just falling backwards into it is how I feel about it. Um, you know, when I turned down, when I finished seminary and I turned down the church gig or the church job, sorry, honey, the, uh, the, the church job, I had on a lark applied to UT. I don't even know why I did that. Do you, Amy? I don't know why we did that. And on, yeah, on a lark, I had done that. I, I turned down that job in Baltimore. And then that night I got a call from Texas 
And so I think that, I, you know, Amy and I have said to each other often that some of the best life moves that we have ever made have been saying no. And, um, and not feeling like there is only one opportunity available. And I think that I have been fortunate in that I have somebody who's willing to say no with me and that I did have a certain uh, skill set that allowed me to seize opportunities when, when they did come and when they did feel right. So that's what I mean, I suppose, by falling backwards. I think I fell, fell backwards into my job at UNI too, um, because I never thought that they were going to offer me the job. And so I treated that interview process very differently than every other process. And so, yeah, I think that falling backwards has been one of the great um, lucky things in my life. Pardon me? How did you treat the interview process differently when you interviewed at UNI? <laughs> um, well, I didn't think they were going to offer me the job. Um, they brought me out. It was a strange, it was a strange process, to be honest. They, there wasn't a phone interview screening. There was an inside candidate already that there was an interim person. And it really felt like that they were bringing me out just so they could get through the process and hire this this other person and so you know I, I just rarely would accept the premise of the of what the committee was asking me to do at face value um, you know they wanted me to do a certain number of they wanted me to do certain music with the glee club for instance and i remember walking in and saying i don't know i don't like this music this isn't good music let's what else do you have in your folder and just choosing something else. And, um, and I think I only did that because I thought, well, I'm only here for a little bit of time. I'd like to make music. This is a really cool, there's a hundred people in this, this is great. And so I think it was things like that. I, I, th I think I was so dis, uh, disillusioned by some of my other interviews that I just, I just didn't, I cared, but, I cared about what I cared about, and I didn't care about what the committee cared about. Have you considered that maybe that's why you got the job? Yeah, I think it. I think it absolutely is. Um, I was kind of wondering. You mentioned kind of how like finding yourself intertwined with your vocation, and I'm wondering how gaining self worth has fit into like where you see God in your life. Um, so you've asked where finding self-worth has led me to see God? And kind of how God has led you to self-worth both ways. Well, let me say that uh, I am not an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I, tried, I tried it on for a while and it didn't fit. Um, and... Um, so, you know, the language that I, but I have yet to really find language that, that feels like the right kinds of, of clothing uh, for me. Um, I would say, but I would say that God has found me through relationships. Um, clearly the relationships with, with Amy, um, uh, with my parents, I mean, and fiercely with my children. Um, those relationships is, is where um, God is, you know, grabbing on to me. Um, I certainly, relationships that I, um, with students, you know, watching students, to be honest, over the last decade or, or more, you know, watching my friends and family um, and students uh, in the LGBTQ community um, has been an inspiration for me and has been uh, instructive to, to witness. Um, and so I feel like that 
you know, the process of becoming has been inspired by um, God has used, perhaps, I don't I wouldn't say that, but that, that has been um, inspired by the relationships in my life. And then, um, you know, informed and instigated and, um, uh, and propelled by music and, and by, uh, and by poetry and, um, by pilgrimage. Uh, is that fair? I don't know. I mean, it's true. It's true. Uh, but I don't know if it's sufficient. No. John, this is Alan. Um, good to see you again. I, yeah. you, you mentioned early on when you were speaking about you, when you went and you left your dad's church and you went to play music for um, a Latino, right? A Spanish speaking church, right? You mentioned it. So I, I'm curious, I was wondering if, um, if you look back on those years of that experience, what, what was the takeaway from that? And, and, is there anything about you now that uh, was impacted by or that you reflect back and you think about those early years? I was just curious. You mentioned it. And I thought, I wonder if, if that was a, you know, a, a part of your broader journey, of course. But I just wonder if it was transformational in any way or, yeah, it, was, it, it, it struck me. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd say that, you know, those years I think those years um, stick in my mind uh, because I feel I feel like that that the those those years at at um, at Primera Iglesia are kind of a microcosm of how I have often felt um, in Christianity um, because you know I would go there and I the i would go there and i and I, I would walk a mile down a highway by myself i would make music and i would have no connection seemingly to a lot of the words that were coming at me um and then next week i would do it again and um and i didn't skip and i would keep trying and um, I feel like that as I've looked back on my relationship, oftentimes with the church, that that has been how it has felt where, you know, I could, I would flunk Baylor Chapel because I wouldn't go to that because I couldn't deal with the words that were coming out of me at that point. And um, the, um, yeah, I, I think that's how I would say when I look back on it is that it, even as a, as a kid at that point, yeah, I think that's, that's what I mean. I think it's why I often think about it. That's not true at First Presbyterian Church in Waterloo, of course. The words that, the words that come out of there are, you know. Nice save. Nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Are great. <laughs> Jane would like me to ask a question about your seminary experience. I love seminary. Um, uh, seminary was the Sunday school I always wanted as a kid. Um, yeah, I, I loved it. I, um, I love scripture. Um, I love uh, the exegetical process of going through scripture. Um, I abide theology. Uh, <laughs> and I disliked most of my um, kind of practical theology courses. Um, some of that is because of just kind of the makeup of how they have to teach those courses. And some of it is, you know, just my own dissonance with a lot of the things that they were asking me to do. Um, I, I loved the, the pace of it as a music major. Um, 
you know, you're never done with classes. It's never over. You, you've never perfected your craft. Um, but in seminary, you know, you finish a class and you're done and you got a break. Uh, and uh, I, lo I loved it. Um, you know, I kind of find I'm a, I'm an introvert and um, an easily, I, I don't know if, if I'm grumpy, but, uh, you know, sometimes seminarians themselves would irritate me um, that my colleagues would, um, you know, I got, I would be less interested in hearing about someone's youth group in class than I would, okay, well, let's, you know, sometimes seminarians bothered me, uh, but I loved seminary. I'd go back in a heartbeat, maybe not to the same one, uh, but yeah, I'd go back to seminary just, just for kicks. Let's do it now. It's great. <laughs> It was also really interesting being married to um, to Amy, who then several a few years after I finished seminary went to a different seminary, and um, that was a really rich time in our lives too, because you know each seminary approaches things differently, and there's some compare and some contrast, and I had this really easy job at the University of Texas, and so. I could go and sit at the uh, at the local pub as the seminarians would walk by, and just sit there and and have a nice beer. And the seminarians would stop and talk about class, and I could just sit there and listen. So that was a neat thing too. Is on a I kind of felt like I went to seminary one and a half times. Yeah. Hi, John. I'm, uh, I'm Drew. Hi, Drew. At Three House, I'm Chef Drew. I do the soup here at Soup Chat. And uh, I just have a question for you. Basically, uh, I've had this discussion with several people, and since this vocation has been ongoing, about the difference in the relationship between uh, job, occupation, vocation, and what you see as your life's work, and how at some point did they become intertwined uh, you may have had the same experience as the young man as I did. I wasn't quite sure what direction I was going or whatever. So my job was just a way to pay the bills. And so I also fell backwards into being a chef because it just happened to be what I was doing to make, to make a living. It wasn't my life's work. But now that you're you know, a little bit older and you've settled in on everything, have you ever had an aha moment where uh, with clarity or something you just, you recognize the interconnectedness between what it is you're doing, what you should be doing and what you want to do in, in a more holistic sense. And thanks. Yeah, thanks. And I'm really jealous of the jambalaya. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, so the Glee Club in, I don't know what year it was, many years ago, um, went to Ireland and Wales. And uh, their, their final kind of dinner that they had was at this place called The Church, uh, which is a, an empty uh, or a, a dis, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dis, uh, what's the, Amy, what's the word? It's not a church anymore, it's just a building. Is and it, it was- Disillusion? Nah, I'll, nah. but it's, uh, it's now a restaurant. And, um, the the guys got there and if if you know the the glee club uh there's one of the things they like to do is sing and another thing they like to do is drink uh responsibly of course um and they had they had enjoyed you know their final meal and um you know you set they're, they're up on this like mezzanine and in the center of the church there where there's a bar and the rose window was still up on kind of on the end. And so we kind of did our final goodbyes to each other. You know, people were to say nice things. And this is not gonna be a surprise to, to Alex or to Jacob, but of course the last thing that we were going to do uh, that, uh, that night was sing Brothers Sing On. And um, I'd, it'd been great, it was wonderful. I could hear, I could hear the students talking, um, I could hear their laughter. 
we had all these memories of the music that we music that we have made, all these stories of, of, about how the Glee Club had impacted them, uh, how the trip had impacted them. Yes, deconsecrated. Thank you. Um, and um, and so I kind of moved towards the center of the group, and of course they're they're around this like mezzanine of the church, and I had this um, this view of the rose window. And we started Brothers Sing On, and I could, I could, they started singing it. And for the first time in my life, I thought, oh my God, I'm making church music. Um, and after trying to do that since I was a kid. And so I, I think that there was a moment of turning around at, at that point and, and, and seeing okay, so this thing that I didn't know was related, it is, it's, I'm making church music. And it's, and it's um, because I only had, not only had the opportunity um, to get the job, but I had support around me to do some work on myself too. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't remember what year it was. I went to a choir concert in the Gallagher Blue Dorn Great Hall, and there was uh, maybe it was a band and a choir, but anyhow, you were standing on the stage directing people that some of the choir was up in the balcony and some of the band. It seems like there was. I don't remember what it was. There was something really powerful, but it was that same kind of you were directing and you were so graceful standing on the stage directing that there wasn't anything for us to watch except you directing. But the music was stunning and beautiful. And I had that same kind of experience. I thought, wait, I like these moments in the great hall. <clears throat> that are sacred kinds of moments like that. So I would be fascinated to hear, uh, yeah, I wanna hear more about church music in a deconsecrated church or other, other examples for you of um, any sort of sacred, either affirmation of you or sacred moments uh, that connect with in the music world, sort of where it brings it all together. Yeah, well, thanks for saying that. That's very kind. Um, right. So, I think that you know the the big uh, intentional uh, journey for me over the last five to six years has has been exploring that very notion. Um, and to be honest, a lot of it comes from the Glee Club, where in the before times, uh, when the Glee Club would take over the OP and and sing together, and I it, I would think well, this is this is sacred, yeah. and um, how do I how do we explore this? Um, I do a pilgrimage ensemble um, where we um, we meet in uh, a little village south of Dublin, uh, and we have one rehearsal. And then we put bags on our pack and walk through the Wicklow Mountains and rehearse in the woods and in pubs and in bed and breakfasts. Uh, and then about a week later, we walk right into Dublin and give a concert. And I think that, you know, those moments, obviously, you know, in the Crone Woods and there's this sacredness and ancient feeling about it that the music heightens and becomes a metaphor for the alchemy of of all of us becoming an ensemble and finding ourselves. And I think the same is true when the Glee Club goes on a tour or when Concert Corral goes on tour, you know, and I think it's, it's one of the great, you know, the, the, the great thing about my job is that I can, I, I'm given full liberty to explore music and poetry and imagine how disparate texts um, 
can fit in together and imagine how sacred and secular are the same thing. And, um, and so I, I don't know if I really have, a, my, I'm certain that there'd be a specific story, you know, that I could tell for any given example, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I appreciate that, that you, uh, kind of picked up on that energy and um it's certainly something that is the among the most fulfilling parts of my of my life you don't by any chance remember what you directed was, was it a was it when you say a band was it like a big wind ensemble band or yeah. or was it like a it was no it was wind ensemble or one of those it was a it was a major some kind of work, and it might have been. I get, I get Terry hearing Ave Maria. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I, I think that we may have done Ave Maria like that once. Um, to be honest, it, it could have been, it could have been that. We had this Ave Maria that we did once in Spain, that, where, um, so as. At the very end, there's this long amen that's come after. So that there's there's three stanzas, three kind of three false takes at the Ave Maria text that the guys do, and then it goes into this kind of loud Santa Maria, big swell. And as soon as you said, "Be with us now, the hour of our death," it moves into amen, right? And um, in Spain, once we were at this uh, at this really old church that used to be a mosque, actually. Because you know how how um, we just just take over buildings, right? But uh, anyway, uh, right after we said now at the hour of our death, and right before um, the amen, there was this incredibly loud thunder strike that shook the whole building, and you could just feel the gasps from from people because it was just it was uh, it was really bone chilling. And it was almost like it was right in tempo with the guys. It was pretty cool. <laughs> you talk about poetry more. We keep mentioning that. Right? Can you talk more about poetry? About what it means to me personally? Yeah. Yes. I love, I love poetry um, because I think that it's um, uh, right next to um, to music in that it's, it's about as close as we can get to God. Um, I think that silence is, is, is everything. I think that music exists to um, inform us about silence. And I think that poetry is, uh, you know, this art of placing silence into our words um, and um, creating space. And so it, I find it, it really appeals to me. You mentioned that one of the biggest places that you saw God in your life is through your kids. Um, would you talk more about how fatherhood has been part of your vocational story? Well, um, there's not a day where I don't want to be better, more myself. You know, I, I, I want for um, my my hope is that that my kids will will feel like they have they know who I am and um, and that who I am is continually somebody who is flourishing into being more patient and more generous and more kind more loving um, more supportive of my my family members and so for me that 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 frankly is my vocation for me, I believe that the, the more that I can kind of become who I hope to be, um, that, the, that that's that. And so, it, it, frankly, it used to be that for like Amy and for the Glee Club and for the students at UNI, right? Like I want to do that on their behalf so I can be, um, so I can, so I can be for them. And now that my kids have come along, it's it's a it's a it's a fierce desire.
a calling for sure. I can hear you just a bit, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Is that better? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've been trying to figure out how to word my question um, because you, you've touched on this a couple of times. I'm curious if you could elaborate more um, on a really specific wording you had earlier where you said that you left your father's church, but along the way in every story you've talked about, you found yourself in the church or going to seminary. And again, you've talked about it a little bit, but can you elaborate on that and and how that part of the journey has been for you? Have you seen Groundhog Day? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I am Christian by tribe and, um, and Christianity is, um, is, is something that I claim and, um, that I hope that I, um, that I live. I, um, I think that, you know, my, my answer to, to all this is probably, so trite, um, but you know, I I went to an evangelical college and um, at Baylor, and I knew a lot of um, conservative Christians, and it frankly just was it turned me off. And um, I am I, I would say a pretty critical. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty critical of of where Christianity. Um, and uh, nationalism has has mucked things up, and um, so, and at the same, so, so I think that's the probably the tension that that you're you're picking up on is 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 that it's inescapable for me to be a, a Christian. I tried not to be. I tried hard not to be, um, and I and I think that. Um, I think that I that I am. I don't know that I could say all of the creed with. I, I can't. I can't say all of the creed with. Um, but um, I don't think that matters to say all of the creed. You know what I mean? Is that that's kind of a bad, unclear answer? I apologize. Oh, it's great. Thank you. I see my song. <laughs> I'm a reluctant but grateful Christian. What do you listen to to feed your soul? Um, music wise? Well, whatever, I'm curious what you listen to that nourishes your soul or feeds your soul. Silence. silence. Silence is the yeah. Silence is the is the top thing. To be honest, if I if I could sit in a silent room for a week um, and not be responsible for anyone or anything, that would be a really nice thing. Um, there, I listen to all types of music. Um, I can't think of, of of what music I don't listen to, and it. Kind of every day, you know, there's a different soundtrack that kind of that goes on every single day. There are some, you know, I, I love, there are some regulars, I suppose. I like Jim Croce. I like uh, Walt Wilkins. Um, I like Nirvana. I like, I like Tupac Shakur. I like, um, I like Mindy Smith. I like blood, sweat, and tears. James Taylor. I like a lot of different stuff. Jacob says, "At what point, if you do, do you need to set, consciously separate your faith from your occupation?" 
Has there ever been an occurrence of this or does your faith follow you everywhere? Well, my, you know, my, I, my guess is, is that um, Jacob and Alex would have a better answer to that than I do because they've, they've seen me do the job. You know, I, we sing sacred music in the, in the glee club and it's not, uh, we're not a Christian institution. And so, you know, generally I try to remove devotion from those moments, any devotion to text I'll remove, but, um, uh, but I don't think that, I, I don't think that I can separate it out consciously. I can just choose not to say, and so everyone bow down and worship Jesus, you know, does that make sense? Um, if you could give us all one piece of advice, what would you say? Trust your gut. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Trust your gut. Read Ecclesiastes. <laughs> um, I was asked in the, the email to to do uh, to share a piece of music that to with y'all uh, to so then the music that the song that I would uh, like to share with you is called um, Trains I Missed by uh, Walt Wilkins. I can find the, I don't know if I went away, but I'm gonna, I'll share, copy link. I'll put it in the chat for you. Uh, mm -hmm. This, this oh, I need to send it to everyone. Click the Paste, send. So that's Trains I Missed by Walt Wilkins. And I'm, I'm a fan of his. So if it's a, we can make it so that we can listen to it now, if that would be. Well, that's that's uh, your ball game. I'm, I'm here to, you know, play ball however you like. Jam, jam. 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 <laughs> Teresa's jam. <laughs> Oh, it's an ad. Yeah. I'll find the lyrics too for us. It's Dave's fault. Here's to the trains I missed, the loves I lost, the bridges I burned, the rivers I never crossed. Here's to the call I didn't hear, the signs I didn't hear, the roads I couldn't take. The maps that I just wouldn't read It's a big old world But I found my way Through the hell and the hurt And led me straight to this Here's to the train I missed I've been a clown, I've been a fool and I pushed on every chance I crossed too many lines Trying to crawl out of God's hands 
But there are stones I didn't throw And hearts I did not break A little hope I held on to The silver shining thread of faith It's been a long way But I found my way And hell and the hurt They led me straight to this So here's to the train To this place I found And the love I know The earth and the sky here That I call home And here's to the things that I believe Bigger than me And the moments I find myself Right where I want to be It's a big old I found my way in the hell and the hurt. It led me straight to the end. It's a big old world, but I found my way in the hell and the hurt. It led me straight to the end. Here's to the train. Cool. Well, thanks. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I was really impacted, but I don't know. I can't speak for everyone else, but we really do appreciate you sharing your story with us. <laughs> well, thank you all. It, it means a lot. I have uh, such great regard uh, for, for Three House and all the students that I've known who've um, been involved with it. Um, so uh, I appreciate it and I hope that y'all stay safe and warm. And um, I want to invite everyone back next week, next Tuesday at noon again. And um, Amy will be joining us to discuss some stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase that. But um, yeah, we really appreciate that you were here with us today. And um, we hope everybody has a good Tuesday and stays warm and next week it'll actually be like above zero for once so <laughs> right. yes we will have food again next week so everybody come get food <laughs> that's great thank you thank you thank you thanks y'all